Part 1. Reality and the Transcendentals. Philosophy, the Transcendentals and Reality. 1. The Impossible Graphs and our Bourgeois Metaphysics. At the end of his collection of essays entitled Heretics, G.K. Chesterton prophesies that and prophecies that the most common sense truths will turn into creeds, requiring the fidelity and courage of martyrs to proclaim in the face of the great march of mental destruction that is modernity. In the concluding paragraph, his tone climbs to an almost fevered pitch, so that one might worry he is uh, overstating his case, even as one admires his genius. Fires will be kindled to testify that two and two make four. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. We shall be left defending not only the incredible virtues and sanities of human life, but something more incredible still. This huge, impossible universe which stares us in the face. We shall fight for invisible prodig prodigies as if they were invisible. We shall look on the impossible grass and the skies with a strange courage. We shall be of those who have seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who believe even though they have seen with their very own eyes. A century ago, such a declaration would no doubt have, would no doubt, doubt have appeared as a comical exaggeration, cleverly employed to make a point. Today, however, we read this passage with a dawning suspicion that Chesterton may have been entirely serious. For a host of reasons we will be exploring, we have been learning to deny the obvious as a matter of course. It is not only that we have become accustomed to deny in public for the camera, as it, as it were, things that we know to be true, which is evident enough, but we have, but we have begun not even to recognize that we know them as true. Camera has become our most intimate conscience, conscience which, which is to say that it has insinuated itself not only between us and the world, but between us and ourselves. The foutable season secret has not only be, uh, been replaced by Big Brother with his extensive system of surveillance, but even Big Brother has seen his place in, in trusting confidence to each person's super ego. We feel that we are betraying something if we admit to certain straightforward truths that are simple there for anyone to behold. There is no need to offer examples of this self-policing in the matters that revolve around the extremely charged theme of identity politics and especially at the moment, moment that which concerns gender. But Chesterton, Chesterton but Chesterton's text suggests that this controversy, however abruptly, abruptly it may have entered the scene just yesterday, is not a strange novelty. Rather, it is arguably the implication of a disposition, the inexorable working out of a logic that has deep roots. Chesterton ended and identifies this logic as modern skepticism, a general reluctance to admit anything as definitely true. Skeptic skepticism itself is, of course, not an exclusively modern phenomenon. The ancient Greek world was well acquainted with eccentric individuals who sought to break radically with their conventional beliefs and through rigorous training to learn to suspend any and every judgment to, so as to achieve a perfectly and in, in, in disturbed tranquil tranquility of mind, of absolute equanimity. It is just this point, however, that sets into relief, which is distinctive about modern skepticism. This, this more recent version tends not to be the result of rigorous training, unless we would use that phrase to characterize the normal program of public education, and it is not so much a break with conventional belief as a standard expression of it. The, more, the modern skeptic is not a heroic individual, but a, an everyday person in the street. The skeptical suspension of judgment is not an extraordinary judgment, the fruit of long ascetic discipline, but has become the default frame of mind of contemporary people. Now, Chesterton is quick to point out the deep inconsistencies in this frame of mind, though it ev evinces 
a reluctance to affirm any definite truth. It is quite definitive about its own truth, so much to so much so that we have to recognize modern scepticism as dogmatic in spite of itself, since it rules out any opposing view a priori. It is the vague modern who is not at, not at all concerned about his right, which most certain that Dante was wrong. There is a humorous self-contradiction in this, but it is important to recognize that this is not a typical one, the simultaneous assertion and denial of a particular claim. Instead, it is a contradiction that goes to the core of what it means to be human. If man is defined as the animal with logos, speech or reason, then this confusion represents man's contradiction of his very humanity, which is why Plato, for example, characterized this loss of faith and reason, which is called misology, literally, literally con the contempt for reason, the worst thing that can befall a human being. But any denial of reason never gets rid of the con contradiction, since we cannot help but affirm reason at the same, same time. As Chesterton goes on to show, quite, ir ir quite irrefutably, it is simple it is simply impossible to be a human being, to put, to put any two thoughts together, to express any preference for anything at all, without presupposing a philosophical vision about the nature of reality, the nature, therefore, of the creature of reality. And so in, in inevitably con quite concrete ways, what it means to be a human being. Every man in the street must hold a metaphysical system and hold it firmly. Even if one hates reason, one will always do so in an, as an animal with logos, and one cannot be such an animal without holding a metaphysical system, whether unconsciously or unwillingly. unwillingly. It, is, it is therefore in the end never a question of whether one has a metaphysics, but only whether one's metaphysics is adequate. Adequate to what? This is, of course, the, the decisive question but we will leave it to the side of, for the moment. In order to say anything meaningful in response, beyond what may, might seem a facile truism, adequate to reality, we, know, we need to reflect in more depth on, on the problem that Chesterton is presenting, presenting here. The problem turns out to be, in fact, much more subtle and profound than it did initially appears. One might get the impression that the traditional quarrel between the ancients and the mo moderns that Chesterton invokes here by characterizing the modern is a, con is a contest between two metaphysical systems, the claims of which might in prin principle be placed side by side and compared so that a judgment could be reached about which is the right one. While it is certainly true that there are different metaphysical systems at issue, the contest is a very particular one in this case, because the difference is so radical. It is sort of like a contest, if such a thing could be imagined, between an American football team and a British, British football team. Not only are the rules governing the teams incommensurate, and not only is the ground under their feet different, but the very projectile around which the game turns is an equivocation. How would one determine in such a context, contest which is the better team? Which is the better team? In the contest between the Asians and the moderns, metaphysics has been challenging, challenged, challenged by a non-metaphysics, or rather, since there can can be no challenge where there is no common playing field at all. As it were, we have to say instead that pre-modern metaphysics has simply been supplanted in the etymological sense of the word. The ground has been taken out from under it so that it is left in a sense floating in the air. In, the air. in this respect, it has been effectively neutralized. And so there ceases to be any need to challenge it, much less replace it by another metaphysics. This point requires more explanation. Chesterton said that swords will be drowned to prove that leaves are green. One might object a response that this is ridiculous. No one denies that leaves are green. If anyone denies some other traditional truth, for example, that one's sex determines one's gender, and one is capable of taking in marriage, 
It is because he believes there is something real at stake here, namely the possible happiness of many concrete individual human beings. But there is nothing comparable at stake in the question of the color of leaves, so there is no one who cares to deny it. This is a revealing objection. Note that the re reason offered here for their willingness to accept that leaves are green is that it does not really matter one way or the other, which is to say that it apparently does not Im immediately bear, bear on the desires of concrete individuals. In other words, we may be willing to admit the truth that leaves are green, but not strictly because it is true. In fact, where we, pre where we pressed on this moment, we would very quickly grow uncomfortable to say that this claim is true sounds absolutist. If we were presented with another person who passionately declared that it is not true, even if it seemed so to us, we would, we would be inclined, inclined to recognize the right of others to think otherwise. How in the world can we know, after all, what color leaves may, might seem to someone else, perhaps from a radically different background from our own? How do we know that we don't all perceive different colors, but ha have just learned to use the na same name for th these different perceptions? In making this concession, we ask only a return that these authors will see who see, things, who see things differently, recognize our right to perceive leaves as green. This is what we, this is what was meant earlier by saying the old metaphysics is left suspended in the air. We, we moderns continue to say, perhaps, that it is true that leaves are green, just as Asians did, but everything is no different. The meaning of true is no longer the, the same, not to mention the meaning of leaves and of green. In fact, the very nature of words have been transformed, since they no longer serve to make manifest what is, but inst instead have become more instruments, instruments for the expression of subjective judgments, the personal content of individual minds. In short, meaning no, means something different, and the very act by it means this different thing is not the same. We are thus talking about as radical a change as can be imagined. To be sure, the reasons, the reasons one might offer to justify adopt, according the truth quite true, of the greenness of leaves are not without some purchase. The ultimately a rhetorical worry that we have just learned to use the same word for what is a different experience for every individual may have something Alice in Wonderlandish about it, but there are more scientific possibilities. One could, for example, point to the physical components of the event of perception, the reflection and absorption of certain frequencies of light waves, stimulation of retin retinal nerves, and so forth, uh, and say that these are the reality of which the subjective, sub subjective seeing of green is simply an epiphenomenon. One might ask them what is actually what is actually means, in fact to call the perception of the green true, and indeed what it means re really in the end to call an anything true, with quotation marks and a capital T. What is gained by putting this additional label on a generally recognized fact, especially if there is no one intent on challenging it?